Hi students, welcome to the Baiju Sindhu News Analysis for 19th of September 2018. So let's get started. So let's look into some of the important articles for the day. So the first article goes with 10 years on uncharted waters. So what are we speaking about? So we will be discussing in detail about the economic crisis that had surfaced from 1997 and then how 2008 crisis happened and what are the various problems that have been surfacing with time? What are the various reforms? and how is that we need to make certain structural changes with respect to the economy so this article introduces all these major concepts with respect to the economic crisis so let's try and understand what this article says so on the introduction bit what we need to understand is when we go back to the history what it says is that there was one of the major crises with respect to the east asian crisis and that was in the year 1997 where these countries which are also called as the tiger economies opened up their economy so they had the full account convertibility and what also was done was there was fixed rates regime that is the government was controlling what would be the rate of their local currency with respect to the dollar but what resultant was the dollar was started moving immediately so there was lot of volatility in the market this resulted in what is called as the East Asian crisis and then what we see is the internet bubble so the internet bubble surfaced way back in the year 2000s and during this period what was believed was that because there was internet penetration round and after without throughout the country and throughout the world what was the resultant was that people started speculating that this would lead to a long term productivity but ultimately the resultant was this became a bubble and it could not result into an economic expansion and at the same time then came up the scandals in the year 2000s which led to the corporate world governance so what do we mean by it let's take for example the energy sector or the telecom sector so there were number of sectors in the us economy where the corporate governance as a whole started meddling with the internal governance and this resulted in scams after scams and scandals after scandals so all these things were the minor ones but what was the major one so the major one was the 2008 crisis so this 2008 crisis which is also called as the lemon brother crisis or the recession crisis impacted throughout the world so let's try and unravel let's try and learn what are the major problems as to why this was the major one and what were the causes with respect to the 2008 crisis when we look into what are the major crises what we will understand is the global macroeconomic imbalances so when you consider the stance right we are living in a globalized economy so each economy is interlinked especially when it comes to the us economy so because the us economy is linked to all the major economies any tussle within the us economy will have a major impact throughout the world so because there was a major macroeconomic problems within the us society within the us economy this had a problem throughout the world and this resulted in what is called as the loose monetary policy ideally what should have been is the monetary policy should have been tight it should have regulated everything but this was not done so because all this was not controlled by the central bank and because the government was not able to look into the sectors of the economy this was the major problem and and the most important problem is us believes in what is called as a market economy so what do we mean by market economy it is something where the government does not interfere with the businesses much and because there is no control over the business by the government the regulatory operations that was supposed to be done by the government is not intact because it is leaving everything to the capitalism part it is leaving everything to the business part so it is the business which is controlling everything here now that the business is controlling everything here what was happening in usa was there were certain greedy banks and there were certain people individuals who did not look at it from the inflation perspective who do not look at it from the economic perspective and what resultant was the economic crisis that resulted in 2008 why because all the people started investing how is that they started investing in all these companies it is because of the fake rating agencies so you have the rating agencies right so these rating agencies go about naming a particular company they gave a particular grading to the system what was happening was there was close amount of understanding between these individuals companies as well as the rating agencies so because all these three people were having a close cooperation negotiation between them there 
there was fake agenda that was running behind and because all these rating agencies started giving certain rank ranking or certain grading which was not actually the fact what was happening was there was major investment and because of no regulatory provisions no central bank control because of the greedy marketing system because of all these individuals as well as the rating agencies what resultant was the major economic crisis in 2008 and this is what we are understanding in this particular article. So what are the major other issues when it comes to the banking system? So when we look into how exactly the banking system as a whole works, there are certain fundamental flaws in the banking system. On one side, what we saw was the regulatory framework. That is the government which should have been a regulator of the market, failed to regulate it. On the other side, what we are looking at is the banking perspective. So what do we mean by it? Let's try and understand what is that we will have to understand from the banking perspective. So the first argument says that one, banks were allowed extraordinarily high levels of debt in relation to the equity and two, banks in advanced economy moved from the business of making loans to investing their funds instead of security assets. So let's try and understand what it says. So what it says in this particular case is that banks are supposed to be the ones who are provider of loans. So what happens in this case? Lending of loans by the banks is one of the major asset a banking system has a major asset and the asset is in the form of me as a bank providing loans to the people so how is it an asset because I'm giving loans to the people I'm giving them the principal amount but what do I get I'm getting here is the interest payment let's say I've given around 1 lakh or 10 lakhs or 20 lakhs to a particular person but I would be charging him a particular interest rate let's say for example 10 percent 20 percent whatsoever it is so what what am I getting in return apart from the 10 lakhs or the 20 lakhs that I have provided this individual or an organization or a company what I'm getting is the interest rate so when it is interested what happens in this particular cases apart from the principal amount of 10 lakhs I'm getting the extra income and that would be let's say around 5 lakhs or 4 lakhs or whatsoever it is so in this particular case I'm getting certain amount back and this is what an asset for the company is but what happened in this particular case instead of working about with respect to the loans what the bank started doing was they started giving securities derived from the subprime loans so they started venturing into the security market they started venturing into the security asset because the banks do not have experience in these things and because the individuals and the bank agencies as well as the grading agencies had inflated the banks were not in a position to understand how these things started working out and apart from this what we also need to know is when a particular loan is given what would happen is the bank would know what are the implications of these loans but in this particular case because they were in the form of a securized assets what would happen is there is a major contrast and what is the contrast that is happening is the loss and the gains of all this have to be recorded instantaneously because the banks are not experts in understanding all these dimensions that has become a major problem so what should have been an enforcement of laws giving of loans but instead what is happened in this particular case is they started moving towards the securized assets and when they are moving towards the securized asset they're not the experts here but in loans they would be able to understand what are the problems they would be able to understand what are the issues that could have surfaced but in here what the major problem is there should be daily analysis there should be daily programming there should be daily recording of all the securized assets this was missed in the banking sector and apart from this what we also need to understand is the short-term lending so what happens in the particular bank is we have something called as fortnightly report where there are small investors as well as the large investors small investors are you me all of us we do have certain transactions so we do in make sure that we actually go about investing in the bank we do put it in our savings account in our current account so what happens in this particular case is but there are also other lenders apart from us giving or investing in the bank and saving in the bank there are large investors let's say for example huge business people so then they also invest in the banks right they also save money in the banks but what happened in this particular case is that the failure of the bank was majorly because the bank started relying on all these 
small or what is called as the short term funds so we would have given certain short term funds so as and when time happened what exactly happened was there was a lot of crisis in the market so these people sense that this money that is used by the banks is their money that is the short term money so they started taking away their funds this also reflected a major part what should have the bank done the bank should have ideally given funds or money where the businessmen or certain organizations which are keeping in the bank for the long term purposes this money should have been utilized but what has happened in this particular case is instead of the long term funds what the bank used was the short term funds so allowing of banks excess dependence on the short term funds was a major problem and when people started sensing that this money was being used they started removing the money from the market and this created a lot of panic so this is also another important factor that we need to understand and apart from this what we also need to look is the bank had low standards for making housing loans so what do we mean by it let's say for example whenever i'm let's say i'm a bank and whenever i'm giving a loan to a particular person or an organization what am i doing i'm looking into the collaterals will buy money keep coming back all this will be looked into what who decides all this so you have something called as the boards of the bank it is these people who will actually look into all this organizational setup whether this particular organization whether this particular individual will have to be given loan but what happened in this particular case is the bank's board which are supposed to look into all these dimensions failed looking at this perspective so they were not looking into this perspective or analyzing what was a major problem but instead went about giving loans in a very haphazard manner now let's link to the the indian perspective the icici bank scam so what happened in india's case the bank's board did not reflect into when there was a particular loan that was dispatched to a particular person and that was video con so the same thing can be linked to the us perspective so the bank board which was supposed to look into who is the person who is an individual who is an organization the bank board will reflect on this background and all these things only then it should be providing the loans but in this particular case again the bank board failed to understand and it actually failed to give up this particular thing so the major problem was also with reference to the boards of the bank so this was with reference to the banking problem so on one side we saw the government problem on the other side we saw the banking problem so what were the major global repercussions so when we look into the global repercussions because us is a globalized economy because we believe in the globalization this had a major problems in europe as well as in asia because all these were interlinked to it and this had resulted into major economic implications so what are the implications that it resulted in what exactly happened was now there was a major economic crisis the central bank of usa had to fund a lot of money the central banks in europe had to fund a lot of money and then the central banks of asia had to step in and provide a lot of money come back to india same thing happened with respect to india as well when 2008 recession hit india the government came into picture the central bank came into picture all the fiscal responsibility and the management act which had to maintain sustained level of fiscal responsibility was completely stopped so the fiscal deficit and the current account deficit that was supposed to be looked into was kept under hold for some time the government started investing a lot of money the monetary policy was kind of reduced and then what we see was there was number of central banks which was actually providing a lot of liquidity support to number of banks so what happened in this particular cases the government as well as the central banks both came up together and they started investing a lot of money into the market why did they start investing a lot of money into the market because there was almost a loss of tranquility because of the economic crisis and because of this the government had to support all these people that is in terms of the employment in terms of the investment in terms of the infrastructure for all this you obviously need money and that is why the government as well as the banking sector started giving more money into the market but this led to a lot of political crisis so what are the political crisis that we have resulted in of so the political consequences was the protectionism so this is not a one step this evolved over a period of time what started with 2008 has improved and has come with time and what we see in this particular case is the political consequences so what are the political consequences you see the eurozone crisis that is problem with the pics countries that is what you see is the paris when you have the 
Italy in this particular case then you have the Greece crisis then you have the Spain crisis so what you see is the eurozone crisis which involves the big countries which means the Portugal the Italy the Greece as well as Spain and then what you see is the pre-exit the rise of the nationalism and anti-immigrant policies the Trump phenomenon in the US and the return of the protectionism so all these things were the major impact as to why this particular idea of 2008 recession and economic crisis has come up to this particular level but how did India actually survived this whole process see we did see that major countries had the problem and major countries had number of sufferings but how did India escape from this particular process when you look into the growth factor India obviously had a slowdown at about 7% but what is the major thing here is that India had certain structural changes so what were the structural changes one was India did not actually embrace to full account convertibility so you cannot convert the rupee into dollar and dollar into repeat right so the RBI actually restricts this particular process so this is one of the major structural reform and apart from this we do not actually let the foreign companies or the foreign banks to enter India and even if they are entering we had certain regulations so this is also the major factor let's imagine now there are number of US banks and all these banks are made to operate in India so what would have happened in 2008 had all these banks were established in India suppose all these banks would get the investment from United States of America so these people would be lending money into the market now because there was a major economic crisis in 2008 that is from USA to India all these banks would stop giving loans or they would stop providing loans to the market or to the infrastructure development so there will be crunch in this value for the money right so all this issue was not faced by India why because we do not allow the full cap capital account convertibility at the same time the foreign banks despite pressure from the US government we do not allow them to function in India that is why India went about having a stable or a comparatively negligent amount of recession felt in India so what is that major problem how is that we will have to overcome all these problems why did this problem as a whole happen that is the major crux of this particular issue the major crux as to why this particular issue happened what were the major causes of this particular issue is the revolving door theory so what do we mean by revolving door theory so let's try and understand this particular aspect of revolving door theory so what happens is you have the political parties in United States so you have the Democrats you have the Republicans so all these financial institutions that that is the banking system that is present in United States so these are the major ones who provide investments that is political funding to the Democrats as well as the Republicans so what happens in this particular case is now that these banks are actually functioning and these are providing the lending why should they provide lending that is because they expect something in return from these political parties so what happens in this particular case let's say for example now Republicans are being funded so Republicans is in the power so what happens happens is there are certain people from this particular banking sector or the financial institution sector who move up to this particular political parties let's say for example the government that is the Republicans will have certain government posts let's say the secretary post or let's say any of the government posts so what happens in this particular case is the banking officials or these people who are influencing this government will move from the banking paradigm and they'll move towards the political parties so they'll be able to make changes according to what the banking institution wants so what is a banking re revolving theory so according to this revolving door theory one that is a person or an individual from this financial institution goes up to the government and he makes certain changes in the policy of the government so that it is profitable for this institution or the banking facility so what would happen in this particular case is the bank would be able to extract maximum mileage from the government so because there was a lot of revolving door theory and because these bankers were moving from the banking system they were changing certain policies in the government that is profitable for these banks that is where the accountability factor missed so because they were influencing the government the state's responsibility of regulating was completely missed so that is the concept of regulatory 
or the revolving door theory and also all these people should have whoever is responsible should have been put behind bars but what has happened in this particular case is that these people were not put behind bars so all these bankers who created a havoc were not put behind bars so there is no accountability factor here there is no transparency factor here but instead what we see is a principle of reciprocity you give me i'm giving you you do i'm giving you the political funding so you make sure that there are certain policies that you change according to the whims and the fancies of the banking regulations because of all these things was also one of the major factors in determining this so what are the measures to be taken so what are the reforms that we need to do so apart from so what we will have to understand is that there are certain core issues so what are the core issues that we are speaking here one of the core issues is some banks in the united states of america are anything are too big to fail we have actually not concentrated on this sector let's say for example india in india we have something called as the sbi so the sbi is one of the most important banks so what we will have to do in this particular case is bring about changes so that we are able to bring about and structure this particular regime so all those big banks like the spi or any other big banks in any country this is not surfaced in the reforms so the surfacing of reform should start from those big banks which cannot be actually dismantled with respect to the economy and the second important point that we need to understand is with respect to the debt so when we see the debt crisis what we see is the private debt but of late what we also see is the government debt as well as the private debt that is in the form of industry so this factor will also have to be pictured in and the government will have to bring in suitable amount of reforms one is with respect to the household sector the other one is with respect to the industry sector and the third thing is with respect to the government sector so the private debt the household consumption debt as well as the government debt will all need to be included when we are bringing about a structural change and apart from this what we also need to make sure is that we know for the fact that we are connected with the US economy so what we should also note to understand is that the world is vulnerable to the US monetary policy so what we need to make sure that that in case there is an alternative apart from the US dollar we need to make sure that we have something so that we are not completely dependent on the US economy so what we need to as a whole do is that we need to have an alternative global financial architecture so that in case there is any problem there is no problem that we face with respect to the changes in the US market so what we see in this particular case is that there is emerging economic crisis that are vulnerable to the emerging markets because of the vagaries in the US economy so we need an alternative structure and if you are able to adapt all these three conditions that is when we will be able to come up with these things is what this article all about so moving on let's look into the next article so in this article what we will be speaking about is in reference to the merger of dena bank vijaya bank as well as the bank of baroda so yesterday when we did discuss about the current affairs we did say that this was one of the important moves that the government had taken where the government plans to unify the state owned banks of bank of baroda dena bank and vijaya bank which will be resulted into the third largest bank with a business turnover of about 14.82 trillion so this was all discussed and we also discussed about the alternative mechanism where how things have to be worked out that is the banks will need the approval of certain requirements from the sebi and then it will require certain consultation from the rbi bank and then what we also saw was the central bank in consultation with the rbi will bring about changes and then finally what we will have is the parliamentary approval all this was discussed in the yesterday's current affairs so what we will be discussing here in this particular case is about the mergers that is the merits of it as well as the demerits of it so when we look into the background this whole idea of merger as a whole took its precedence because of one of the important segments that happened in the year 1991 so what happened in the year 1991 one of the important things was the narsimhan committee report so what the narsimhan committee report did was it came up with one of the structures and it said that all these banks that is the public sector banks there are n number of public sector banks these public sector banks will have to be regrouped or it has to merge 
or it has to be amalgamated so that there are certain structures that it laid so what it said was that we need something called as a three tire structure so on the first thing what we need is something called as the national banks so these national banks will be three in number and this will have the international presence so the first point that it made was something of international prominence that is you will have one national bank and this national bank will have international prominence that will be the first one in the structure and the next it dealt was that there will be amongst this will be about three national banks is what it said and next what we will have is about eight national banks and these national banks will be there throughout the nation one on one side what we had was the international presence and on the other side these eight national banks should be there with throughout the nation and then third thing that it said was that there needs to be large number of regional and the local banks so this was the structure that was laid by the Narsimhan committee why are we discussing this because the whole background of merger or why the government goes about with merger is started off with the Narsimhan committee report so the next thing that we will have to understand is why was this particular decision taken so you had seen in the past as well that SBI was also grouped with the number of other state banks for example the Trivandrum or the State Bank of Mysore and this all as a whole became the State Bank of India now the decision that we will have to consider is why did the government take up this particular decision as a whole so what was the basis on which the decision was taken by the government for which we will have to understand certain arguments so what are these arguments so one of the things is India is aspiring to be one of the global economies India is aspiring to be a global superpower and India is the fastest growing economy in the world so India has to be supportive and it has to have a proper framework and the structure when it comes to the economy and for which what we need is a competitive banking so in order to support all these things what we need is a competitive banking in order to make sure that we have a competitive banking that is why the government has come up with this particular move and also as discussed yesterday Dena Bank is one of the banks which is actually placed in the prompt corrective actions so you have two stronger banks that is the Bank of Baroda as well as the Vijaya Bank but Dena Bank is not comparatively that good so what happens in this particular case is so when you are gelling up these three banks what we will be having is a more customer base more market reach as well as operational efficiency so what is the second major objective so you have a weaker bank and this weaker bank is in the form of Dena bank so when I'm gelling up with a stronger bank what will be the resultant is the operational efficiency the competitiveness as well as the regional base so this is also one of the important things and apart from this what we will be able to generate is we would be able to give massive credit requirements and even the infusion that the government does for these banks will be comparatively reduced so in order to make sure all these things are done that is why the government has taken up this particular issue and apart from this what we also need to understand is now that the government has looked into this particular factor let's say the weaker bank and gelling up with the stronger bank apart from this the government also takes up certain other decisions let's say for example in terms of the geography so let's say there is one particular bank let's say for example the Baroda Bank or the Dena Bank the approach is such that all these banks are concentrated in the northern area in the southern southern India it is not much concentrated let's take in this particular case Vijaya Bank is mostly focused in the central I mean southern India but it's not there in the northern area so what government does is in order to get the geographical reach in order to expand the number of branches it also merges that is the merger is done on the basis of geography so the government can also look into this perspective now what the government has looked into is from the weaker stronger branch perspective but what the government can also look into into is from the perspective of the geography so that there is more reach throughout the nation and apart from this the government can also come up with something called as the niche markets or the niche banks so what do we mean by it where the focus is explicitly on certain area let's say for example the playment banks or in for example certain restricted area in order to make sure all this is done the government will take up certain 
things so what are the advantages now that the government has taken up this particular move what we need to understand is that there are certain merits or it has certain advantages so what are these advantages is what we need to understand in this particular case so the major advantages as we already discussed the government would have to infuse a lot of money and this has to clean up the balance sheet so in order to make sure the government does not infuse a lot of money because there is merger of all these banks there will be a lot of customer base and because there is a lot of customer base there will be a lot of capital infused when there is merger so the first point that we will have to understand is the government infusion can be comparatively reduced and the second thing that we have just discussed a large number of customers will be there so because we have more large number of customers in this particular case what we will see is the broader geographical footprint and that is the second point that we need to understand and the third important point that we need to understand is the talent pool so what happens in this particular case now there is merger of all these banks so you have the number of managing people you have the CEOs you have the bank people you have the number of leadership people who control all these banks now the minute it is merged what happens in this particular case is large number of people that is different number of people from different background will come up and they'll be able to bring about changes in the banking paradigm so these are some of the advantages but what does this article speak about about the article speaks about certain concerns so the major focus of this particular article is the concerns part or what is called as the challenges part what this particular article goes on to say is the government goes about merging up this particular banks so the problem is where is the evidence okay that now you have merged up this particular bank but is there any evidence that this particular merger or this particular idea of amalgamation of banks is it leading to the operational efficiency no so because there is no evidence as a whole how is that the government is able to come up with this particular dictate so what the government is doing in this particular cases it is a majority stakeholder because it is a majority stakeholder all that it is doing is it is not considering the minority stakeholder it is dictating terms to the minority stakeholders now there is no evidence we saw the SBI is it led to any operational efficiency any profits not assets there is no statistical evidence so because there is no statistical evidence why is that the government is dictating the terms is what this article goes about speaking and at the same time what it also leads to is drop in the employment so now that these employment is generated when there is number of banks but when there is merger of banks what will happen is there will be overlap of certain functions so because there will be overlap there will be reduction in the number of people so the employment provision will also be reduced and apart from this what we need to consider is the culture so when there is a problem in a particular bank what happens is each style of a leadership will define a particular problem in a different way they have solutions in a different way but what happens in this particular case is because of all these three people coming up together the leadership will have certain tussles that is because there is a culture there is an environmental setup which is completely different the culture for solving a particular problem will have issues and that is the third problem and apart from this what we also need to consider is this employee this idea of merger will actually send out poor signals so what do we mean by it it means that the government is actually facing a problem so because the government is actually facing a problem it is merging it so it is sending a poor signal to the outside market that the economic condition is not that good with respect to the banking so what will happen in this particular case is that those people who are wanting to invest in India actually sense that the economy is in a poor problem and then they'll stop investing in India so these are the major concerns as to what this particular article goes on to speak but what is the way forward so when we look into the way forward what we will have to understand is that this consolidation as a whole that is the merger as a whole is a very good principle but this mergers should be on a basis of a stronger basis so you need two stronger banks coming up so that there is increase in terms of the geography the customer base and all these things but what you are trying to do in this particular case is you are meddling with the low weaker bank so what this can result is a drag on the operations so this has to be avoided so what we need to make sure is that we need to make sure that there are certain synergies that are there all these synergies will have to be accepted and then we'll have to 
exploit the scale efficiencies and apart from this what we also need to make sure is we need to make sure that this is a multi stakeholder approach so you have three different banks it will further have the banks bureau it will have the number of leaders or the managers you will have to consult them first so the minute you consult them it becomes a multi stakeholder approach because the government is a major stakeholder it did not have to unilaterally decide but instead what it has to do is it has to first discuss with them it has to take the approval of the banks managers as well as boardrooms and then only after taking the views of the stakeholder that is when the government needs to come up with such move is what this article all about so moving on let's look into the next article so the next article says celestial misfit so what is this we are speaking about so what we are discussing in this particular case is about planet pluto so what happened in the year 2006 was that planet pluto was actually defined as a dwarf planet but not as a planet so what was considered as a planet was changed into a dwarf planet according to the norms of the international astronomical union so what happened was that with time they came up with certain regulations so in order to define what a planet is and what a dwarf planet is they came up with three set of rules so what are these three set of rules one is it must orbit the sun so you have the sun here so you have the planet that are there here so what should happen is all these planets that are there in case they are supposed to be called the planet they will have to orbit this particular sun that's the first criteria that it speaks about and next thing that it speaks about is it should be massive enough to acquire an approximately spherical shape so any planet which is moving throughout the sun or orbiting the sun will have to have a spherical shape in case it has any other shape that its mass is not able to take up the spherical form then again such planet will not be considered as a planet so the major two conditions is it should be surrounding the sun that becomes the first one and it should have a spherical shape and that becomes the second one and the third thing that we have to consider in this particular case is that its mass or what is called as its weight should have a maximum gravitational pull within its body that is it says the object ventures close to the planet's orbit will either collide with it or accelerate it or be ejected it out so what do we mean by it it means let's take for example in this particular case the pluto so why was the pluto put outside the that is because it was not able to take up the third that is the maximum gravitational pull there was neptune let's take the example in this with reference to neptune so there was neptune here there was pluto here so there was a gravitational pull of the neptune on the pluto so because there was gravitational pull the neptune had on pluto the pluto started deflecting this was not supposed to be the case right so according to all these norms pluto met the first two conditions that is it started moving around the sun and it also had a clear orbit that is it had a spherical shape so because it met the first two conditions that is why it was called as the dwarf planet and why was it taken off the planet list that is because this particular idea that it should not be deflected by the gravity of another planet was not sustainable because there was certain gravity that was deflected and because the pluto came under the influence of neptune because this third condition was not met that is why pluto became the dwarf planet but what is the problem right now so the problem right now is that there is one of the proposals that comes up from philips metzger who is one of the planetary physicist who works with nasa that is national aeronautics as well as space administration so he has come up with one of the hypothesis which says that this whole idea or this third rule that we looked into what came up in the year 1802 and this was given by william hesfel so this particular idea that is the third rule that was supposed to be followed uh, does not have any basis as such this does not have uh, any theory backing as such because it is an hypothesis the whole idea of naming pluto as a pl dwarf planet cannot be taken easily so even in the earlier steps there are number of physical concepts let's say for example photon was there photon was considered it did not not gain prominence but then it later gained prominence so what happens in physics is that you have certain fundamentals this will be proved true and this will be proved fact and these things can change with time so what the e goes on to propose is that this particular planet that is planet pluto is not a dwarf planet but instead it can be taken as a planet is what this physicist actually goes about speaking but what are the complications so when we look into the complications what it goes about saying is one of the 
important things that we need to consider is about Charon. So what is Charon? It is the Pluton's moon. So this can also be one of the important factual question that can be asked from the prelims perspective. So the question is Charon is a satellite or which is the moon of which planet can be a potential question. So kindly remember Charon is the moon of Pluto. So what happens in this particular case is what the article goes on to say is the Charon is much too large to be called a satellite. So what we will be discovering is that it can be a part of a binary planet system. And apart from this, what it also says is that recent research shows that both the Cupia belt as well as the Oort cloud, a shell of objects that surrounds the entire solar system far beyond the Cupia belt contains objects that can also be called as planets but these are currently also not called as planets so what can be the problem is in case we go about naming this particular planet that is currently out of this particular area right now currently what we see is that planet Pluto is a dwarf planet but in case we are again renaming this particular planet then we will have the issues with respect to conventions so what are the problems the major problem is this Charon which is the moon of Pluto can actually be called as the binary system that is the binary planet system why because its size is too huge and also this QPR belt and Earth cloud will also be called as planets in order to avoid all these things issues what we need to sustain is the same model is what this article speaking about so moving on let's look into the next article so the next article speaks about SEBI cuts expense ratio for the MF schemes so let's try and understand what this article is all about so the first thing that we need to understand in this particular cases what is this expense ratio when we understand the concept we will be able to understand this much better so let's say for example there is a prospectus and this particular prospectus will have certain a structure and framework which will help the particular investor let's say for example there is a bank which is which is a mutual fund manager who is called as X and say let there is another individual called as A so A looks into the prospectors of this particular company that is a mutual fund company and he look into it and will start investing money into this particular bank or in this particular mutual fund so what happens in this particular case is so he is investing in this particular case why because he wants certain outcome that is he wants to expect certain profit in this particular case that is why he is investing but what happens in this particular case is you have this asset management company or what is called as the AMC so this particular company will have certain functions and it has to pay certain people why it has to pay people because you have this particular prospectors this prospectors will have certain structure and this structure will be providing the profits and in order to generate this particular profit to this individual what this asset management company has to do is it has certain operational costs so what are these operational costs that we are speaking about the first operational cost that we are speaking about is with respect to the professionals so there are certain professionals who will have to maintain and sustain this particular program or in line with the particular prospectors so what they actually look at is they look at the track development they look how exactly the market works there'll be certain statisticians there'll be certain mathematicians they also see how exactly the market is functioning so because these people are employed they'll have to be paid salary and that is why this AMC has to recruit these professionals so the first point that we have to understand is the operational cost will involve professionals and these professionals will have to be paid salary that's the first thing and apart from this what we also need to look at is certain other things let's say for example the legal expenses or certain other things like the rent and so on so all these things will require money right so this profit or whatever money that this particular individual is paying certain amount is deducted from this particular profit so in order to make sure that this particular company is able to take care of its expenses certain amount of money is detected from the profits or from the principal of this particular individual who is investing in that particular company so what this article goes about speaking is so this percentage that the company actually lifts off from the profit of an individual is comparatively reduced is what this PSEBI article is all about 
about so what we need to understand is every day there will be new investors or new number of individuals who will be investing in the mutual funds and this is what is called as a net asset value if the number of funds if the number of investors are comparatively small let's say the number of people who are investing in this particular mutual fund are comparatively small then the operational cost will obviously increase but let's say the large number of people who are investing in this particular process then the operational cost will comparatively reduce so what sebi has done is that in this particular expense that is the total expense ratio that is the company using the profits of these individuals will have to be reduced is what sebi has said so sebi sebi actually can make certain steps or take steps with respect to the equity fund or with respect to the debt funds or with respect to the index funds or with respect to the fund of funds for all these things sebi would be able to make certain ste steps so what sebi has done is for all these companies that is the asset management companies you cannot take much of the profits from this customer base or from an individual is what this article all about so what it has given is in another major decision the regulator has capped the maximum expense ratio at 1.05% for open ended equity schemes with assets under management in excess of 50000 crores currently the schemes with asset management in excess of 300 crore is charged at 1.75% but now it is reduced to 1.05% that is it has said the asset management companies you will have to take the profits only up to 1.05% what was it earlier it was 1.75% and next it says sebi has laid down a range of 1.05% to 2.25% what is the current one it is 1.75 to 2.5% so there is again reduction so what is the significance of this so when we look into the significance what can be is that if i am the investor if i am an individual who is investing in mutual funds i'll be able to claim more profits for myself what i was doing earlier i was paying more for the expenses for these professionals for these legal experts as well as rent that is the operational cost but now the company will have to reduce this so i as an individual will be getting more profits and apart from this what this article also goes about speaking is there are certain laws which are managing the losses in the market so what are these the regulator has framed the sebi settlement proceedings regulation 2018 which bar offenses that cause a market wide impact loss to investors or affects the integrity of the market to be settled through the consent route and then it further goes on to say that while serious offenders like insider trading or front running can be settled through consent the regulator has said that it would use the principle based approach while deciding on such matters so what we have to understand in this particular case is that there are two ways of settling a particular issue so what are these one is called as the rules based approach the other one is called as the principle based approach so what happens in this particular issue is rules based approach is that particular issue where the sebi actually lays out certain rules so you have the number of companies in the market so you have number of organizations so these organizations will have to follow certain rules that have been laid by the sebi so this can be almost linked to what is we know the concept of polity right in polity we have something called as procedure established by law as well as due process of law so what is the rules based approach is similar to the procedure established by law so what happens in this particular case is there is a particular law so this organization strictly follows these laws but they'll be able to make certain changes let me give you an example so you have a cigarette pack that is there so on the cigarette pack what you have is the government rule says that you will have to have a particular length but what happens in this particular case is the government it says that you will have to follow a particular dimension when you are actually printing this particular message the government has given this particular law but what does the company do it prints this particular ad with that particular height but it reduces the width so that this there is no clear perception or the clear message that can be read so what happens in a rules based approach is the spirit is not considered but only the law is considered but what happens in the principle based approach it is something like the due process of law apart from what 
whatever is the established norms or the structures what it also looks into is the spirit behind that particular law in case there is a violation apart from what are the set norms then the sebi will be able to make suitable changes accordingly and will be able to penalize this particular organization so what sebi has also said is that apart from this the sebi will also be looked into the principle based approach in order to solve the issue is what it has actually gone about saying and then the last important issue it speaks about is the board of the capital market has also approved a framework for permitting foreign entities having an exposure in physical commodity market to hedge in commodity derivatives in segment in india this is one of the other things for the rest of the things we have already discussed and in the weekly business videos we will be taking up more of these videos okay so moving on let's look into the next article so this is just a factual information article all that we will have to understand is that there are certain facts and we need to understand these facts but from the important prelims perspective what we will have to understand is the disparities so what it speaks about within a country within a particular region is under five mortality rates among children in rural areas are comparatively more than the urban areas this can be a potential or a likely question in the prelims because UPSC has been asking questions like this with respect to certain statistics so what is that we will have to know so disparities that is the problems are more in the rural area than in the urban area so this is the first important prelims point that we need to consider and apart from this it says those born to uneducated mothers are more than twice as likely to die before turning five than those born to mothers with secondary or higher education so kindly remember these two important factual data because this this can be a likely question and apart from this what it further goes on to say is what are the causes with respect to the killing or the preventable diseases is that more children under five due to preventable or treatable causes such as complications during birth pneumonia diarrhea nipple sepsis as well as malaria in comparison children between 5 and 14 years of age have injuries which are prominent cause of death especially from drowning as well as road traffic so these are the major reasons as to why we see the mortality or the death of the children so what is the conclusion so when we look into the conclusion how can we stop the mortality or the death of the children one is you need to bring up certain structural reforms by the government as well as the international organizations and then what we also need to do is we need to provide certain simple solutions and what are these simple solutions that we are speaking about like providing the medicines or clean water electricity as well as vaccines so this is what we need to understand from this particular article so moving on let's look into the next article so the next article says us china step up trade war slapped it for ta tariffs so what is the context so it says the trade rivalry between US and China escalated to an unprecedented level with both countries announcing new tariffs on imports from each other so what we have to understand is the chronology so when we look into the chronology it started way back in Jan 2000 2018 us imposed tariffs of 30 percent and 20 percent on solar cell and washing machine imports and us president trump imposes tariffs of 25 percent and 10 percent on steel and aluminium imports from all nations including china then as a reciprocal effect what china does is it slaps duties on 3 billion of us imports including fruits nuts and wine and then this goes on and on so what the us has currently done in this particular case is the us has announced us tariffs will apply to 215 billion of chinese goods and chinese tariffs which will apply 110 billion of us goods and the rate of new tariffs will be raised to 25 percent by the end of 2018 so this is just a factual data as what usa has done and china has reciprocated back and with reference to china what it has done is it has also imposed penalty with respect to the oil the smoke beef coffee the floor according to the provisional list so there is penalizing tariffs that have been put up by both these countries from both the sides we have already established or put up a video on the youtube with respect to the protectionist stance what is the trade war and all of it but in this relevance what we will have to understand is only this for rest of the analysis we have already uploaded a video kindly look into it for the same so moving on let's look into the next article so this is with respect to the important prelims focus and that is to do with the akash missile so what is the akash missile it is part of the integrated guided missile program which was initiated 
initiated in 1984. It is made by Bharat Dynamics Limited. Akash is a surface to air missile system. Akash can fly at supersonic speeds ranging from Mach 2.8 to 3.5. Akash has a range of 25 km and can engage multiple targets at a time in all weather conditions. It has a large operational envelope from 30 meter to a maximum of 20 km. Each regiment consists of six launchers, each having three missiles. Akash missile has an indigenous content of 96%. And now what we have is the enhanced features that has been upgraded. So we have the Akash which is upgraded or the enhanced version. So the upgraded version will include Seekler technology and possess a 360 degree coverage and will be of a compact configuration. It is operationally critical equipment which will provide protection to all the vital assets. This is important from the prelims focus. So this is again important because it is a factual information and UPSC has been asking questions with respect to all these things. So kindly pay heed to all these important facts. So kindly visit the Baiju CNA, look into the practice questions both pre as well as mains, write all your answers on the comment section so that we can evaluate and give you the relevant feedback for the same. So this is it for today. Thank you so much. All the best.